Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Zoom and on Facebook. I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy, and we are here today to discuss the stunning Rainforest Defenders series um, with uh, Francesc, our lead editor of our Democracia Abierta project, um, who's joining us from Barcelona today, and um, Pablo Abarenga, the very talented um, photographer who, who shot the series, and Nora moraga Louis from um, the Pulitzer Center, who set up the, um, the Rainforest Journalism Fund that supported this project. So this is gonna be less about talking and more about showing. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually gonna ask my colleague Adam to show um, one of the films that this series produced as an opener to show everybody um, the work that was produced in the setting. So um, yeah, this is the first film um, and it's about um, Vera, a midwife um, based in deep in the Amazon. Apologies, we're trying to fix the sound. You can see the beautiful images, but not the sound right now. <laughs> um, momentito, por favor. <laughs> Try, we're going to pivot because um, Adam's going to try and fix the sound. <laughs> um, so we'll discuss a little bit of background for the project, first of all, and then we'll come back to that very beautiful, enticing film um, that you just saw. Um, I suppose the first question I was going to ask um, was to uh, Francesc, which was, um, tell us, what was the story you were trying to tell with this project? Well, in fact, uh, behind the, the, the health emergency around uh, COVID-19, uh, climate uh, crisis is ongoing. No? So we are, and we are already too late to tackle that. So we wanted to, to deal with this. Now, global warming in, in 2020 uh, was uh, the hottest year on record at the same level of 2016. Brazil's Amazon rainforest uh, suffers worst fires in a decade the last year. And uh, all these and, and many, other issues are uh, happening in the in the Amazon uh, are only uh, a sample of what uh, really is is happening at the global level. And um, what we wanted to do is to answer uh, a, a, a simple question: you know, how uh, how are the people living in the Amazon dealing with uh, with this huge problem? So we wanted to bring. Uh, into the micro micro level, a macro question in order to make it more personal and see how there are people there and not it's a global warning, warming and devastation of the Amazon is not uh, an, an abstract question. It's not a matter of statistics, but it's also a matter of uh, the people living there. So we wanted to make it personal to tell the stories of, of, uh, of uh, young people defending their territories, and that was the, the and the purpose was to show that even though these are major global challenges, they are also people on the ground that are, are not only suffering but also uh, fighting for for this uh, to stop all these uh, these catastrophe. And that's the the, the, pur the purpose was that not to bring that issue and not, uh, and bring a new angle to the climate crisis through telling the stories of people on the ground. That was the main, the main uh, uh, purpose of the, of the project. Thank you, Francesc. And yeah, I think one of the things we can do, whether or not we do have sound or not, is show some of the stunning images um, from the project. So 
Um, I wanted to uh, talk to you, um, Pablo. I mean, you've done previous work with indigenous people in the Amazon, and we're going to be showing some of the slides now of some of the photographs that you took. And um, in particular, you decided to use drone images. Can you tell us why and sort of what, yeah, how you decided to, to use this technique and, and, and why it was why it felt right for this project? Well, actually, uh, I've been working with indigenous uh, for something like five years. Uh, and one thing that I that I have found uh, and understood, uh, mostly in my first uh, story involving uh, Guarani Kiowa indigenous in Mato Grosso do Sul, where it was complete, the, the forest there was completely destroyed and, and turned into soybean fields. Was, I, I, I had the question about how or maybe why these people are still that attached to these lands uh, that were completely deforested, destroyed and turned into soybean fields. And uh, after working a lot and, and chatting a lot with them, uh, I really understood that it's not about what that territory has in terms of uh, richness for us to extract, but about uh, religiosity and about uh, a, a really strong bond with their, with their territory, their ancestrality, their, their, um, their relatives that, that have passed away are buried there. I mean, there's, those are sacred lands to them. And the way we see the land is it's really different because we want to extract wealth from it. Uh, and that's how we relate with it, with the, with the territory. Uh, so I really wanted to to visually show this this relationship, this bond, this really strong bond with our territory, in a really simple way and in a really visual way. So I I started thinking about photographing them from a bird's eye view, uh, laying down on their on their lands. But then something was missing because I, I really wanted to address the issue that was affecting the land as well. So that's when I started to think about uh, composing these diptychs. Uh, and I and I called a friend of mine and we did the first try here in Montevideo in a, in a, in a square near my home. And then we realized that, that the idea could work. So when Francis came to me with this idea of, of portraying these five stories, uh, I thought that that was that the great uh, a great opportunity to try this out, and actually we, we found out that it worked. And when you look at the images, you you have the people looking at you really straight, uh, and then the territory and the bond that they have with the territory is much more clear. Uh, and I, I think it 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 has another layer, uh, which is a, a really powerful message for all of us who live outside the Amazon. Uh, we think about the Amazon as something important to us because we think about the oxygen, uh, we, we think about its importance in, in its relevance in climate change, but we are forgetting about the people. And I think that there's a, a really important message there because there won't be an Amazon if, if, it, if, if it wasn't because of them, because they are struggling there, they are, uh, spending their life doing all this that we are taking advantage uh, from. Thank you, Pablo. And, and um, staying centered on um, the people in your photographs, it'd be great if you could tell us what, what we're looking at. So tell, tell us some of these stories. I'll ask you maybe to explain which one we're looking at right now, the story behind it. And then I'll ask Francesc to explain some of the other ones. Okay, this is uh, Julian. He's an indigenous uh, from the Achuar nation of Ecuador. And what you can see at her, at her right, uh, it's a new road that's breaking through their, the rainforest. And it has now arrived to their community. At the point we went there, uh, the road hasn't been completely built. And that's something like, um, I think it's not a mountain, the word, but uh, a, well, let's say a mountain uh, that has uh, that it took like three months to break through uh, with this uh, road. And the thing is that roads are like a virus in the Amazon because 
it is true that they that they communicate the, the people with the cities, but also it opens uh, a door to to uh, woodloggers and people trying to to take advantage out of of this new roads. So wood in the, in this community is being a huge problem right now due to this uh, roads. But there's other communities deep inside that are trying to to protect the, themselves from this kind of of roads. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to the next slide, Adam, and I'll maybe get Frances to do it. Yeah. So Frances, who are we looking at now? What's, what story is this? Well, the, uh, this one was a story about uh, this uh, very young uh, uh, lay, uh, girl who uh, was um, or oh, who is fighting against the plastic uh, debris that is arriving into the beaches and the river. This uh, so this this kind of contamination of, uh, of in the in the in, in the in the shore is something that uh, is very disturbing but the, the story goes beyond that because it, it tells the story tell, uh, talks about this girl or how um, connection with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the uh, bigger cities and the, and the and the modern economy let's say is bringing products in plastic uh, packages uh, to the villages where they are not uh, ready to recycle, to deal with plastic garbage. So plastic is contaminating a lot. And the kind of food they, they is bringing by package, uh, this packaging is also destroying the uh, traditional way of uh, uh, the traditional diet, the traditional way of growing, growing um, uh, food and eating food and cooking. So all this, this story was about this, and this group of in the, of, uh, of of people of the village, and young people, were organized in order to combat that and to try to to teach the community how to deal with that. You no, know, by because you know they used to burn all this plastic. This is the only way to recycle. Let's say recycle, but uh, this is uh, something quite uh, also contaminating and dangerous because if they burn. Uh, in not in the right time or whatever, they, they also set up some wildfires and so on. So this and this young uh, indigenous uh, uh, lady was very active. She, she, she was about 20 or whatever, but she managed to mobilize the whole community to, to do that. And a way of preserving the, uh, the ecosystem was uh, to slow down uh, the consumption of uh, of uh, of this kind of of um, of products uh, being in in, pla in in plastic and try to to uh, to uh, keep the traditional uh, agriculture alive. Thank you so much, um, Adam. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay. So, Pablo, who are we looking at here? What's, what is the story? What story does this picture tell? This was a really interesting and, and teaching story because to be has shown us that territory is a concept that goes beyond the, the, a parcel of land. Her struggle is against um, gender violence and she is doing a great job in uh, empowering other women to address this issue. So it, this is the only picture actually that in which uh, the territory that we photograph is not a parcel of land, but to be uh, back. And she has a, pain, a body painter, uh, which is a snake, uh, which symbolizes uh, something like, like strength and resistance. Thank you so much. And we're, we're gonna come back to a couple more of these images, but um, while I let tr Adam try and fix the, uh, the video, um, and if not, I'll try and screen share it for mine. I'd love to come to Nora, um, just to talk a little bit about, um, you know what? Like what the journal? Why why did the rainforest journalism come about? The rainforest journalism fund support supported this project, and I'd love you to just tell us sort of what the rainforest journalism fund is there for, what you're trying to do with it, and how it's kind of distinctive in the journalism space. Thank you so much, Mary, and congratulations again to Pablo and Francesc for their amazing projects throughout the couple of past years. 
So I'm here just representing the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and we generally support journalism on systemic and underreported issues around the world for audiences who may not know about those issues or may not have heard a specific set of voices on those issues. And the Rainforest Journalism Fund, which was launched in 2018, specifically aims to raise awareness of the urgent issues affecting our world's tropical forests. The way that we do this is by directly supporting quality independent journalism on tropical forest issues across the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. And I should also note that the Rainforest Journalism Fund was an idea that's been had by um, some journalists who have been working in the Amazon for a very long time, and they were really the inspiration for this initiative. And then the Pulitzer Center was selected as a partner to administer it, and also because we work really hard with our grantees to maximize the impact and visibility of their stories, not just for a general public, but also in the classroom and, you know, uh, elementary schools and high schools across the United States and in universities around the world. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and we're very honored to work with journalists like Pablo and Francesc um, and, you know, all over the world all the time. And so um, tell me about the kind of how, how this approach is a little bit different and um, why do you think this 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 style of this, this approach to journalism is so important because I mean Frances described it as the task was to make the journalist invisible right that's that's the aim of it and and yeah talk, talk a bit about that that purpose I suppose yeah so this project has been really interesting and so useful again for engaging people from the ages of like 10 and up, you know? Um, I think one amazing thing about this project is how Francesca and Pablo, they had a, a sort of like a plan and then they let the people who they wanted to feature tell the stories themselves. So this I think brings a new set of voices of people who as we've heard are living, breathing these you know issues in the Amazon um, every day and they're letting them tell those stories themselves. But at the same time, we're given a lot of context, historical context, visual context from literally zooming out and seeing the territories or the, you know, the issues that are being addressed by these by these leaders themselves. So I think it's it's actually an example of storytelling that both personalizes very abstract, you know, global issues that it's hard to put your finger on, but it also provides context for really personal stories. It gives us many reasons to care. So we were really excited about this kind of innovations in visual storytelling while still going really in depth in the, the writing, the text itself. Thank you. We are gonna try again to hear from the, um, the people whose stories we're trying to tell. So please bear with us, I apologize. Ah, perfect. Somos mujeres como la selva. Somos sagradas. Antiguamente el parto sabía andar en la selva porque tenían mucha vergüenza porque en la casa, en la casa había bastante gente, sus vecinos, bastante, entonces no podía ir. Si está sola puede pasar algunas complicaciones. Si no llegaba la mamá, no gritaba nada, sabían ir a ver y la mamá a veces pastaba muertos. Esta planta ayuda para dilataciones de una mujer si está trabajando ya empieza la labor de parto y también le ayuda para la hemorragia. Esta plantita también le ayuda para el... Tiene mucho dolor al mamá. Le da calentando la vida. Esta plantita también igual. Es para, para, para el parto. Para que dé rápido el parto. Para que ya descanse la mamá y le da agüitas. Igual. 
Este es tomar, este, escuchar el latido del bebé cuando ya nace. Este es tomar la presión de mamá si está bien en el labor de parto. Si no tiene baja presión para saber esto. Este aparato es para saber el mamá si está bien o no está asustada, no tiene fiebre. Este doblar es para escuchar el latido del bebé, si está bien, ya para nacer algunos normales, para saber si está bien el bebé. Nuestra selva es nuestra como madre, nuestra casa, entonces nosotros no queremos perder nuestra selva. Porque en la selva tenemos muchas farmacias, mercaderías, ahí nosotros buscamos. Esta es medicina. Esta es la ayuda para las heridas, para, para cicatrizar rápido. Y ahí como se calienta sale juguito y eso se pone. Una gotita en, en esas carachitas de lesmaniasis, ahí se cura. De 15 días se cura. Esta planta es muy sagrada, se llama sangre de drago. Esta plantita se... Sacamos la leche, es ver el rojo y le damos, entregamos a, las, a los niños que tienen holanda, que tienen diarrea, que tienen dolor de estómago y la mamá también tiene hemorragia, se puede tomarle. No mucho, poquito, haciendo mezclando con agua para que le puede parar la hemorragia. Es mi planta que yo sembré y ya está crecida y algunas mamás vienen saben sacar la leche, por eso tienen estas pisaditas. Bueno, yo no me casé porque a mis compañeras, a mis hermanas, que le vi en mi ojo cuando casaban y también estaban maltratadas. Por eso yo como que estoy cuidando mi salud, mi cuerpo, por eso no me he pensado casar. Me daba mucho dolor porque estuve viendo a mis hermanas maltratadas, a mi mamá también cuando era pequeña que le vi, y eso me causó en mi corazón. Dije, no voy a casar rápido. Mejor voy a preparar. ¿Cómo te sientes? Yo estoy bien, claro que tengo malestares un poco, pero uh -huh. eso es normal y como ya tengo ya cuatro hijos, tengo experiencia de eso, pero un poco molesta, pero ya, que puedo, es normal eso. El objetivo del proyecto es para empoderar a las mujeres a chuar, indígenas en la comunidad y en la selva ecuatoriana. Antes nadie hacía visitas prenatales, no sabían mamás también, no sabía cómo está su posición su, en su vientre el bebé. Nadie sabía, daban parto así simple como sin saber. Y ahora estoy luchando para, para hacerme como una doctora, para poder ayudar aquí en misma comunidad, para poderme venir a trabajar. Eso estoy soñando yo. Y hacer empoderar a las mujeres, porque las mujeres a veces no tienen voz. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we finally got to got to see and and, and hear them. Um, and we'll, um, we'll look at a couple more during this um, during this session. Um, Francesco Pablo, do you want to say anything about that particular story that um, that or, or how you told it or you know sort of the making of it and um, and and why you felt it was important to include? I think. Um... It, it has a powerful message uh, in regards to colonization when we talk about medicine, for example. Uh, we are used to uh, basically deny what everything that what's different from what we created. And they have a, and especially Vero, uh, Vero has a powerful knowledge uh, about traditional medicines and medicinal plants that are there 
that they have been using uh, for centuries. Uh, and I think we, we have a lot to learn about this. So I think that that's uh, a really important thing about this story. Thank yeah, you. If I, if I may add, uh, so this was a, a, a very difficult story to, to get uh, out because of the, the taboos surrounding the gender violence and, uh, and the, the process of birth itself, which is uh, sacred. So it was not clear. So this was not the story that we, we, we had two stories clear when we went to Ecuador, but this one was the third one. We wanted to be a woman uh, to tell their story, uh, to her story, but it was not clear. So it was a whole process of, let's say, not negotiation, but uh, yeah, not to understanding how the codes of the community we were there to understand how they would would, would let uh, uh, Vero to talk talk to us and that it was not it was very moving and very rewarding in in, in a sense to get her story out and to to empower her, her voice and she finishes the the film saying no sometimes women ha women have no no, not a voice in the community, that's really the case. So she is really a revolutionary in that community or in, ge in general in the Ashwa community to, not to start uh, changing also uh, practices that are, are coming from, from a long way, but in a, in a way that the combina combination of tradition and uh, technology, uh, and this also related to Another the, the story we were there about the solar solar energy and how they use the solar energy. So it's a whole revolution, and and it shows how smart and how how uh, you know the how intelligent these people are to combine things and to try to find their own way through, and not only buying the the you know the the as Pablo was saying the neo colonial way of doing things. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've teed up quite nicely. I think we're going to skip a film and, and go to go to the solar power one, um, Adam, because you've teed up that point very nicely that, that many of these stories are stories of, of ingenuity and creativity and brilliance. Um, so I think we'll show one now that, that sort of speaks to that point. Um, El proyecto Cara Solar en la que yo estoy trabajando es ecológico. Cada vez más se habla del calentamiento global producto del combustible. Así que una buena alternativa y que también nos favorece a nosotros los que vivimos en la selva, en la Amazonía. Eh, es importante pensar en otras alternativas. compañeros integrantes en este proyecto Cara Solar que es eh, netamente para barcos solares eh, entonces ellos ellos están eh, súper eh, dedicados a este proyecto que están capacitándose y ellos quieren hacer y así se debería dar aquí debería dar no con batería tiene que subir. 22, 22.2. 22.2 debería ser. Entonces estaba. Tal vez por el sol. Sí, 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 s
que es de 360 watts cada panel, entonces la sumatoria le llega a, la, a las baterías. Podemos observar las baterías con las que funciona eh, el motor, luego de los cargadores acá, a las baterías, que tenemos 16 baterías. El motor es de, de 7, 7 kilowatts, es eléctrico, eh, actualmente funciona con, con paneles solares, batería y se alimenta eh, de energía eléctrica. Eh, a nivel nacional en Ecuador tuvimos un, un paro, un levantamiento indígena. El tema de combustible no fue nuestro objetivo. El tema de combustible eso era secundario. O sea, eso eh, no era para nosotros, sino más bien eh, vendieron nu nuestros recursos. Eso era, eh, a más de lo que también querían imponer medidas económicas para nosotros, que ya hablamos de soberanía y el gobierno no son los únicos, en las nacionalidades tenemos otro medio y otro, otra propuesta que el combustible. Nosotros no queremos que vaya expandiendo pozos petroleros, o sea, que pare ya. El gobierno no está respetando nuestros territorios. Eh, cada vez más negocian con, con compañías transnacionales y ocultamente ellos hacen pasar que ha, han pasado con una consulta previa, pero no, no. Y significa que no lo está respetando. El territorio posee vida que son los árboles. Eh, en ella existen como alimentos, existen eh, recursos para, para recolectar la fibra, eh, existen medicinas necesarias para, para la vida. Actualmente el mundo va calentando, se nota acá en los territorios también, se ha notado, hay vari variación de actividades dentro de la selva. Estos son, son muy importantes para hacer casas eh, familiares, casas de, de, de gallinero, eh, es importante, esto es el material más preciado aquí en Charamenta y para todo el pueblo Achuar. Eh, raíces tablares nosotros utilizamos en, en casos de emergencia uh, para poder llamar o advertir de que hay un peligro entonces eh, se le toca con palo con palo y suena eh, lejos para que se escuche cuando suena varias veces el sonido debe ser repetido por tres golpes casi cada minuto el futuro de las nacionalidades indígenas aquí en Ecuador, eh, yo me imagino, veo emprendido proyectos como transportes solares, que es amigable al ambiente, yo lo veo autónomo a la nación actual. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we got that sound working. Um, uh, Pablo, did you want to reflect at all on, on that on that story in that film? And Frances teed it up quite nicely that the point of sort of um, ingenuity and creativity, but anything else that sort of really struck you about that and, or about the making of it? Um, actually, it's really interesting how uh, one thing that, 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 I, that I loved about this community, Charmenta, is that uh, they are really interested in doing projects uh, alongside with, with people from outside the community. But one thing that they they really ask is that they get involved and they get um, really, really to be part of the project. So Nancy, for example, is, is the, the guy that is leading the project in her community, in, in his community, and he's really into it i mean he's learning electronics he's doing a lot of things uh because sometimes we are we what we do is we propose great 
uh, life-changing projects to go to the communities to develop and we go there we we have and we when, when, once we let we we leave the place we live with all the know-how about how to maintain this technology and, and all those kind of things so he talks a lot about sovereignty i think that's the word uh and i think that that that's really a really inter interesting way of we looking at these things uh, they want to be part of everything that is done in their community, and they want they want to have the possibility of leading all this as well. Thank you. Um, this is something that a number of people asked um, who signed up for this for this session. V versions of a question of how can we help? How can we show solidarity? How can we support? Questions about whether it's a good idea to give money to large organisations like WWF. But I think I think it's it's a broader thing because several different people have asked it, which is some version of how can we show support and solidarity with um, the people in these communities that you've that you've um, been engaging with. So that's a question for any of the three of you, really, if you have, um, you know, it's, we're, we're stuck so far away and, you know, movement is restricted because of COVID and, you know, we're, it, there's a sense that this is a, um, a, a problem which has global dimensions that a lot of, a lot of the ways that in which these communities um, are under threat is something that affects us all. So, yeah, just any any reflections on on that, I suppose, from from any of the three of you. I mean, what I think obviously what strikes me about that film is that they're doing pre pretty well. <laughs> you know, I mean, like they don't they need to, they need to be saved. There's not that, you know, there's not that that kind of di neo colonial dimension to it. Um, but I wonder if there's anything that you that you've observed or experienced that is a useful insight to bring to a global audience asking those kinds of questions. I can get started and then Pablo and Francesc will have really concrete examples, I think, of the impact that even this reporting and supporting reporting like this can have um, on those communities. Um, abilities to self-advocate, even raise funding, for example, and maybe there are opportunities for audience members to get involved in those ways as well. Um, but from my perspective, um, I think something that even journalists and editors have to remind themselves is to question their assumptions and biases and preconceived notions of places that might seem so far away. So I think one easy small step that was well, maybe not so easy, but a small step that one can take in their daily life is being very conscious of the information that one consumes and look for pieces that might you know, challenge your stereotypes or challenge your notions of what the Amazon is or of what other environmental problems or challenges might be and how they affect or don't affect local communities. And then of course also about the agency of the people who are involved in the front lines, right? So I think challenging ourselves to reflect on that daily um, and of course, continuing to support independent media um, outlets and journalists who can continue to bring these stories to your attention. And of course, in some cases, you know, hold important, powerful actors accountable. Um, the Pulitzer Center also supports investigative journalism that specifically tackles supply chain issues or issues in enforcement with governments or actors. So um, I think those are two things in the sort of macro context of consuming journalism. Thank you there, Nora. You did part of this, my sales pitch job for me, so thank you. <laughs> but I think it's, and I say this not just on behalf of Open Democracy, but, you know, important investigative journalism and storytelling that, that centers um, um, local subjects and local communities, I think is, is, is so, so important. Was there anything else that either Pablo or Frances wanted to say before we go to the next film? Well, I may add, um, Nora has put it very, very uh, beautifully. But I think um, the important, the important thing people can do first is to 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 understand that uh, something, you know, that that they they don't have the truth, or that something is happening there, and uh, uh, and to to develop a kind of empathy and also respect of what for for all these communities. You know, there are there is a, a lot of arrogance around. Uh, how we are going to save the world instead of of uh, understanding, making an effort of uh, uh, not to being humble and saying, well, no, we have all these frameworks, we live in the cities, we live in the, in the first world, we, we know what's going on. And in reality, we, 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 we don't know really what is going on in, in the depth, in depth. So if this kind of, of, of uh, of projects or journalism uh, 
allows people to to understand uh, these issues and to humble them. I think this is the contribution and how they contribute. And no, this kind of journalism is what what uh, I think is uh, is need is more needed to be encouraged and to be supported because there is a lot to learn about what is happening, but in a humble way. Yeah, thank you, Francesc. Um, I'll get Adam to put the the sign up to the the Open Democracy newsletter and 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 particularly to follow um, Democracy Abrieta on on Twitter and Facebook, and we'll, we'll put the details in there because I think you know um, we share our work, but we also share good work that other people do, and I think that, that that's very important to kind of show that solidarity. I think we'll also show the film that we were going to show previously now as well, um, Adam, because that kind of frames some of these issues as well. So this is the next film. Eu sou engenheira Pium, da engenheira Pium, da equipe de Tório Maró. Eu sou coordenador do Conselho de Engenharia da Pós de Azara Pium, o CITA. O grupo de vigilantes foi uma ideia da própria FUNAI de, de formar esse grupo para que eles pudessem estar monitorando, fazendo a vigilância do território, ou seja, fazer tipo uma volta no território para ver se estava tudo ok, se não tinha alguma coisa ilegal. Durante a rodada que a gente faz no território é feito relatório e é feito também as denúncias com esse relatório. Então, são feitas fotos e, e a gente já teve bastante sucesso quando a gente, é, uma das, das ações que a vigilância fez detectou que tinha sido derrubadas 26 árvores dentro do território. E era é, uma madeira ilegal que estava saindo do território e a gente conseguiu barrar e fazer a denúncia nessa madeira. Onde tem aqui a casa abandonada, onde a gente chama de casa branca e é dos próprios madeireiros que, que fizeram, né, tipo uma, um local de esconderijo dele também e a casa está abandonada né? então, e está tudo dentro da área indígena, então isso é nosso a gente vê que está abandonado, já tem bastante mato aqui ao redor Cabo. É, então a gente tá aqui no, na casa ó, onde a gente chama que é a cabeceira do, do arraia. Essa casa está dentro da, da, da própria da terra indígena, onde eu tenho um garapé do arraia aqui que também foi soterrado e, e causou um dano muito grande também na, na própria natureza. E aqui era uma, um dos, dos pontos onde os, uh, os, os empregados dos empresários ficavam. Então, nesse momento a gente chega aqui, a gente vê que o caseiro ele tá, tá aqui esses dias, né? Agora, nesse momento, ele acabou saindo, a casa tá fechada, tá com dois cachorros aí dentro. Então, dá pra ver que o caseiro, ele permanece aqui nessa casa, ainda tentando cuidar pra dizer que a, que a casa é deles, né? Mas, na verdade, a casa é nossa. Até identificou ali a com nossa terra. E aqui está a ameaça, provavelmente, do caseiro, ou dos empresários que fizeram essa, deixando pra nós, dizendo que é pra nós, estamos em dia. E aqui o, o nome do, do presidente atual, que é um dos que, que não gosta da gente. Para mim 
a, o trabalho de vigilante, eu vejo que é importante por devido a gente ter, ter o domínio do, do território, até porque não, é uma luta que não, não, é, não é eu sozinho, enquanto liderança estou em defesa do, do próprio território, mas sim uma coletividade grande e essa coletividade estamos todos unidos juntos para defender o próprio território. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I mean, that obviously tells the story very starkly of um, many of the issues um, we've been talking about. Again, I'd invite uh, Pablo or Frances just to summarize anything about that story, that either the telling of it or, or the context of it that, that you think is important for this discussion. Well, I think this, this story um, summarizes very well the idea that, um, well, no, we talk about extractivism, but we don't know exactly what it is. But then when you go down to the territory and then you see you know, the damage and how ravaging and how, you know, how the, the predatory the activity is and how, you know, the, and how on the one hand, and how these uh, communities who fight for, for, their, for their line the land are so uh, no, determined to, to, to defend that, that, the territory and they do it in, in community. So this is also uh, a lesson. It's not, you know, when, when you see this kind of this leadership that you see there, this kind of leadership, it's not one guy who leads, it's uh, the community. No? So it is a whole process of, uh, of engagement that uh, I, found, I find very, very teaching of how community can, can organize and get organized and, uh, and, and defend these uh, against uh, forces that are overwhelming because this, you know, this is something that happens every day and, and it is uh, you know, the famous story about David and Goliath, but still, still they, they are doing their job and still it is very, very telling how they can organize, how they fight, how they, how they understand and how proud they are of the of the resistance. I think this is this is the underlying story of, of this and, and the other the other also the other stories we, we made. Thank you. There's a question that's come up about you know did you encounter any problems or resistance sort of traveling around from the authorities that might not be friendly to indigenous communities or anything of that nature? That's someone that's just asked that question. Was there was there anything that you saw or witnessed or experienced that? speaks to any of that or not, not in your case. No. It's, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, maybe like all the time uh, people ask those, those questions uh, about uh, security for journal and on, on the journalist side. And I like to answer always like the same thing. I mean, Imagine that if we face, mm -hmm. we can face issues uh, or problems or threats on the field. Imagine being an indigenous uh, on that place and what are they facing every day? Um, of course, there's there's people that don't, don't want the stories to, to come up uh, to see the light, but I, I always want to, to drive the attention to to where, where the, the real problem uh, remains uh, and it's on their side. I mean, they are every day, 24 seven on the front lines. Uh, and I think that we, we, we should really pay attention to this. Uh, of course, we have to, to, to take care of the journalists. We have to take care of safety and those kind of things. Uh, but I think that uh, some communities are, of, of course, we want to, to bring a positive side of the stories because it's not everything about murder and those kind of things. But there's communities that are facing nightmares every day there. So I really want uh, the audience to be conscious about this. Thank you. 
uh, and, and about the importance of this. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a very good play, place, place to leave it. So I just wanted to thank all the panel again. Um, I would really encourage you, we've only shown a small fraction of the films and the um, images, and there are beautiful um, narrative pieces accompanying um, all of this. So I would encourage you to read, watch, share, spread the word, um, and support this type of, of, of journalism um, wherever you see it and, and amplify it wherever you see it. Um, so yeah, Adam's put a link in the chat. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, and have good mornings, afternoons, evenings, rest of the day, depending on where in the world you are. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.